Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Thank you, Brady. Thank you, band. Thanks for being here today. <laughs> little, little chilly. <laughs> little chilly. It's good to see you all. Good to be with you. Um, I thought I was done with 2023 a couple weeks ago. Maybe you hope that we were also. But, but I, I got this magazine. It's called World Magazine. It, it really is truly a, a, a biblical perspective on um, current national and international news. Uh, I would highly recommend it. World Magazine. You can, you can Google it. Uh, very, very good journalism. And I've gotten this for a number of years because I was looking for a new source that I felt like truly was uh, neither right nor left, just something that was a biblical worldview. And so uh, take a look at that. All right, if you, uh, if you want more information, I'd be glad to get that to you uh, later on. At the end of every year, World does a particular uh, one whole uh, magazine to the news of the year, 2023. And so, so I was just, just doing some reading and, and I was reminded again of, of some of the things that happened both nationally and internationally that, that in uh, March of this last year that the church, the Covenant School, uh, the Covenant School in Nashville of Pres- the Covenant Presbyterian Church, um, 28-year-old woman uh, makes her way in and, and guns down. Uh, several children and, and, and several adults. There were natural disasters this last year. I don't know. I don't keep track. I don't keep a record. I'm sure somebody is, but my goodness, there seem to be just a lot of different natural disasters. Why? We don't know. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we do know what God always hopes that somehow we will, um, that we will see him more clearly and come to him in those situations. I was reading about uh, in, in the, uh, the Libyan city of Derna that they had this huge, huge kind of a flood and it was like this two-story wall of water that crashed through the dam and destroyed almost all the entire city and like lies upon lies upon lies and homes and all those kind of things. And then I read at the end, I thought, well, you know, I mean, those, that natural disaster happened. And then I realized that, that there was like seven or eight people that were like city workers, people responsible for making sure the dam was safe, who hadn't done what they were supposed to do for whatever reasons. And, and just news goes on and on and on, uh, both good, but a lot of things that we saw and encountered and understood that we just, or, or that, we, that we don't understand. Obviously in, in October, uh, the Hamas uh, strike on Israel and how that goes on and, and all kinds of different perspectives and ideas on what should be done in that situation. One I had not even heard of, of a man who was a minister in Kenya and of a particular ministry and that he decided it would be a great idea if all his followers would starve themselves to death so they could go home to be with Jesus, including children. They found like 400 mass graves on the land of this particular ministry. Uh, Man, it's just a tough year and we are reminded. I don't mind to start out with (laughs) with just the darkest of moments, but, but I just couldn't help but read that and be reminded uh, that, that God took the formless and he made form and he, and he created, he, crea- he took disorder and he made order and he took, you know, he just took nothing and he made beauty out of it. And, and we talked about a little bit last week, the idea that, that when we do things the way God designed for them to do, then that order continues. Uh, but when we don't, that order goes back, begins to slide back into disorder. And that's true whether we are talking about the national news or international news or whether that happens in our own lives. 
and, and, and that, that, we, that he created, he created light from darkness. And when we decide to do our own thing and go our own way, that we go back into the darkness. We encounter that in some ways every day. Well, uh, last year or last week, uh, when, we, uh, when we landed the plane, uh, we were, everything was beautiful and good, right? I mean, God had created the world and we kind of walked through that quickly and he just, he continued to pronounce, this is good, this is good. And he made man and man was by himself and he said, this is not good. So he creates Eve to be his, to be his suitable helper. And man, then it was really, really good. It was a good place. When we left last week, it was beautiful and it was good. Uh, I'm gonna stop for just a second here and, and make a note that I think my next slide is the wrong verse, okay? All right, yes, all right? And so we're gonna, we're gonna back up just a second, all right? I wanna read to you where we stopped last week, all right? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And that in that one verse is a pretty good idea, a very good picture, if you would have it, of what God designed. No shame, no disgrace, transparency and honesty and intimacy. That's what God had in mind. Chapter three. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So he says to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Now, I don't want to sit here long. I just want to point out a couple things that we see. Hopefully, you have your scriptures open in your app or your Bible. All right? I always want to encourage you to have that and be looking at that, even though we try to show some of those, some of those passages up on the screen. A couple things just want to notice. As the serpent, the enemy comes to Eve. A couple things. One that when that happens, truth is immediately twisted and that will always be a part of temptation. The truth will be there, but the truth will be twisted. The second thing will always be a part of it is they will do everything possible for you not to consider or think about the consequences. That's huge. Some of you guys have heard me talk about um, uh, years ago our grandson Knox when he was about four or five that uh, we were sitting on a Saturday morning and uh, the whole family we were all together and we were doing donuts that morning and Knox comes through and he is on his way to uh, through the living room to get another chocolate donut and his father is sitting next to me on the couch and uh, and Lane kind of sees where Knox is going uh, and I don't know if Knox asked about the donut and Lane said now Knox said um, no more donuts no more chocolate donuts, you've had enough chocolate donuts, okay, don't have any more chocolate donuts, all right? And then he added, I think because he knows Knox, so if you get another chocolate donut, we'll have to go to the back room and you'll be disciplined. Knox looked at him in the eye, understood clearly, the, okay, walked into the kitchen, walked back out of the kitchen with a chocolate donut in his hand, and walked back to the bedroom where the discipline would occur. <laughs> right? Lane made the consequences clear. Knox, at four, weighed them out and decided the chocolate donut was well worth the consequences. Yeah. Right? The consequences by the evil one are never, ever, ever made that clear. Never, right? So the truth is twisted. The consequences are always made to be forgotten, all right? 
There's always a promise made. Anytime there is a temptation, if you can stop and put your feet on the ground and get your head together long enough, you'll know there is a promise that will be made. And the last thing is that God's goodness in some way, his ability or desire to be, take care of you will be questioned. And the serpent says, you will be like God. And at that point in time, Satan, the serpent, tapped into the deepest anxiety of humanity. What is that? Is it snakes? No. Is it, is it, is it spiders? Is it falling from heights? No, it's not any of that. Is it public speaking? No. That is not our deepest anxiety. At that point in time, he spoke and tapped into the deepest desire, and that is this, the fear that what I have, no matter how good and plenty it may be, is not enough. It's that haunting suspicion that someone has it better than I do. And not only, catch this, do I not have enough, that being the fear, but I am not enough. I am less than. Hmm. Oh, one other thing. Satan will make it anytime he tempts you and I, he will make it personal. He will make it specifically personalized just for you. Genesis 3, 6a. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, okay? Pay attention to that. Because what you just see is not only have, have we talked about the different things that are part of temptation, but we're going to talk about the why of temptation or how he gets to your heart and my heart. In those three things, here's what you see. You will be provided for if you do this. You will have pleasure if you have, do this. And you will have power. When Eve saw that it was good for food that it was desirable for the eyes, the pleasure, and that it would make her wise and understanding like God. Those are three things. Folks, listen. Paul will say later on in one of his letters, we know his strategies. This is his strategy. When he comes to you, he will hit you, if not in all those ways, he'll hit you in the way that he knows that you struggle with the most. So here's our question before we move on from here. Provision, pleasure, power. Which one of those are you most likely, you, to take the bait on? Do you know? You might want to raise your hand and no. <laughs> I know the answer to that. You need to know. I realized it for myself a number of years ago what the one that really will really set the hook for Steve Moss is? You need to know because the enemy does. I promise you the enemy knows. So, so think about this. Think about this. Where are they right now? Where, where are Adam and Eve? Go ahead and answer that. They're in the garden. And who else is in the garden with them? God is in the garden with them as well as a serpent, yeah. Do they have a single need? No, they do not have a single need. Not one need or desire that would not be satisfied necessarily. I was, I was reading in my quiet time just a couple of days ago, I'm reading through Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy is basically kind of the, Moses retelling the, the, their story to the people before they go into the promised land. And in Deuteronomy 2, it says basically, it says this, hey, I know I knew that you were in the desert. This is after the 40 years. He says, I knew you were in the desert. I was with you and you lacked nothing. You lacked nothing. But, but temptation often strikes, if you think about it, temptation often strikes not at our today, but at our tomorrow. Because isn't it funny? I mean, I know from, for me, I know that God can provide what I need and my desires on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But guess what happens on Friday? I'm worrying about it. 
I'm wondering if he will provide for me on Friday. Completely my forgetter goes into action and all of a sudden I've forgotten his faithfulness in those first four days. Temptation, if you think about it, most often strikes about will I have what I need tomorrow? And that is why Jesus has so much doggone stuff to say about anxiousness and worry and why it steals so much of our attention, so why it steals so much of our energy mentally and spiritually and emotionally. Well, let me just say before we go on this. The tragedy is not in the temptation. We spent some time talking about the temptation because I believe that we have to know ourselves and know a little bit about the enemy to know and also know what God has for us. But the temptation or the tragedy is not in the temptation. Here's the truth. Enticement happens. Enticement happens. Right? Can we... We, we agree with that, right? It happens to us daily. It is why that if we go through, if you go through one of our Celebrate Recovery uh, programs on a Thursday night or in one of our step studies, here's something you're gonna hear very quickly. We live moment by moment, moment by moment. We don't get caught up in what's gonna happen next hour or next day. We live, we're in that moment, living the battle that Jesus has for us in that moment. And Jesus himself was tempted, we know that. So, so the tragedy is not in the temptation. The writer of Hebrews will even tell us of Jesus, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Here's the tragedy. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. God created the world, beautiful world, said it was good. And he breathes life into dust and he makes it a man in his image. And he looks at the man and he creates in his goodness and his concern for man so that man will not be alone and so that they can be go forth and multiply. He creates the woman so they can be together. He takes disorder and makes it order. And we make the catastrophe. We bring darkness to the light. Take a deep breath for me and please hear this. Sin is not simply bad behavior. It is not simply the absence of good behavior. Sin is a willful choice that you and I make a decision that God cannot be trusted to pro fully provide all I need and all I desire. We wanna make it about behavior. And that's why we spend a lot of time in our life lopping off bad behavior. But what do you find? The fruit grows back. Because sin has never been just about the behavior. It's why Jesus will say in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Evil thoughts? Evil th murder is an evil thought? Yeah, it's an evil thought before it ever becomes an action of violence. And when you look at that time, as Jesus was talking about, it comes from the heart. That's because they understood at that time that the heart for them was the center of desire. It's where desires sprang from, both good and bad. And you and I wonder, don't we? I mean, have you ever just read this and go, Adam and Eve, you're in a beautiful place. You got all the trees. You got all the fruit, you got everything you need. Why the one in the middle? Why'd you have to go there? And then you gotta ask yourself this question. The one we don't wanna ask, am I any different? Am I any different? Brothers and sisters whom I love, what's happening in your heart and my heart 
when you continue to buy what you cannot afford. What is happening in your heart when you continue to put down coworkers or your boss? Well, what happens in our heart when we burst out in anger at our child? That when we can't have a conversation with anybody, Harley, without somehow kind of working our successes into the conversation, making sure they know that we got it together and we're on an upward climb. What is happening? And are we any different when we are demeaning or critical of our spouse, the gift that God has given us, when you complain? <laughs> not a little, but a lot. Or when you are anxious, not a little, but day after day worrying whether you will be taken care of in some way. Are we any different? Oh, what, what happens when you fantasize women about another man other than your husband for whatever reason? What happens when men, we fantasize about another woman than our wife and, and we are saying to God, the gift you gave me is not enough, God. He knows Deuteronomy 2 says again that you were in the desert and he walked with you in the desert and you had no need of anything. Now, when we talk about the catastrophe or sometimes what we call the fall that might be in the heading in your Bible, what, what this is, this is the, you see this almost, this is almost universal. Someone sees this and everybody knows, oh, Eve took the bite of the fruit, right? We've made it an apple, okay? We understand that. It's just people see that. I, I think it's an okay picture. I think maybe it might be better, this might be a more appropriate. We have that slide? Because the essence of every sin, my friends, is spiritual adultery. You and I giving away a piece of our heart that right belong, rightfully belongs only to the God who created you in his image. And so we see something we want, so we see something we desire, and we make somewhat hastily most of the time that decision that, that, that I really need that. And along with that decision is I really need it, and I don't think God is capable or willing to give it to me, and so we take the hook, right? We are enticed and we bite. The catastrophe is that through Adam entered sin, and as a result of that, all have sinned. And if sin, sin is not just behavior, sin separates. It breaks the trust. It breaks the trust between us and God. His love is steady for us, but it breaks that trust and it creates separation. You've, you've been there with a friend, right? Someone that you have trusted for years. Someone that you, th that you just thought would always be there for you, would always be there faith, faith before you. And all of a sudden, you realize that either once or twice or a whole bunch of times, they have not been faithful to you. They lied. They didn't come through. And that, that trust is broken. And you may love them, but you won't trust them. Sin at its core is adultery, and it is a breakage of the trust in the relationship. But, but if it's, it's really not, as we look at this, it's really not just that first, first offense necessarily, right? I mean, that's wrong, it is sin. I don't wanna minimize that. But what really, what the story here is, I think more than anything is what happens next. And what happens next, my friends, is kind of the main place I really want to camp out for just a few moments this morning. I want to make sure that your heart hears this today. Because I think the main thing here is not just the sin, but it is our response and God's response after we sin. What happens is the eyes, it says, of both of them were opened. 
The eyes of both of them were opened. But Satan has said, when your eyes are opened, what? You will be like God, right? But something different happens. The eyes are opened and they are aware of their nakedness. They knew they were both naked. And so all of a sudden you go from the beauty of the garden and the design of God in the last verse of the first chapter or chapter two, chapter two, excuse me, they were naked, but they had no shame. And all of a sudden, they are naked, and there's shame, and there is disgrace. What's their response? Their response first is to cover their shame. Ever had shame in your life? some place where because of your sin there was shame what are the effects it leads us to step away from other people we want to back away we, we don't want to look people in the eye we, we think in our heads here is how they are going to respond and so we move back as far away from that as we possibly can sin leads to shame it is a consequence the evil one will never tell you sin leads to shame and shame always leads to secrets and secrets will sink you every time Secrets will sink you every time. It's why if you've ever been a part of our Celebrate Recovery program, we have this saying we say often, and it's a true, true, true saying. The saying is this, you're only as sick as your secrets. We're gonna find out why in just a second. I think that Genesis 3.8 is possibly one of the most sad verses in the entire Bible. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Think about that for a second, would you? They are in God's perfect place, placed there by a God who loves them. And they are hiding themselves from the God who has given them life and everything good. Something else I've never really thought about before, but somehow it, it kind of came off the page to me this time. Not only are they hiding from God, but they are hiding behind the trees. Well, that makes sense, right? They got to find something to hide. But, but these trees are the gift of God to provide for them. These, these are a gift, and as opposed to, to they're hiding, actually, instead of enjoying those gifts, they are hiding behind those gifts. They are allowing the gift of God to get between them and the giver of the gift. And that's just weird and wrong, right? But how often do you and I take something that God has given us a gift, and all of a sudden, we begin to find our security, we begin to hide behind that. And that gift that God provided for us to provide for us to bring us pleasure all of a sudden becomes a very wall between us and the very giver of the gift they hid and we my friends have been hiding ever since we've been hiding ever since well, it's worth the question right why do we hide why why do we hide? I think just, let me toss a couple out there. I think we hide sometimes because we enjoy sin, <laughs> okay? I mean, scripture is very clear. Sin is a pleasure. There is a pleasure to sin for a time. And sometimes we just wanna, we don't wanna see God because we like being where we're at. We are enjoying it. I mean, let's just be honest about it. If you don't, if you've convinced yourself that sin's not pleasurable, then you have not faced reality yet. Why else? Because we want to believe that we're good. We really do. One of the reasons that most people do not love God fully is because they have never become fully aware of how bad they are and that they need the grace of God. God. 
And as long as you and I believe that we're actually pretty good people, we really do not need God's goodness and his grace. And we hide from him. Be kind of all kinds of arguments. And I I don't understand that in the Bible. If I could understand that in the Bible, I would give myself to the Lord. I would surrender to him, but not until. There's all kinds of reasons. We don't have time for them. And also sometimes because their view of God gets this. Some of you guys come from a place, for whatever reason, a family or a church, some kind of a background in teaching that has taught you something about God that is not as true and what you are getting ready to read and see and hear will might surprise you very much. We hide from God. God questions him and those questions are a chance to come clean. He says, I mean, like, where are you? He called to the man and said, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you? What is God doing here? God is giving them an opportunity to step out from behind the tree and look him in the eye and say, we blew it. God knows the answer to the question did you eat of the tree of the garden? You, you did? I did not know that. Surprise! God knew. God knew. Those questions were intended, my friends, for his children whom he loved to step out from behind the tree and own up and confess and have a contriteness in their heart. And what did they do? They hid. They hid. Not only did they hide, but they blamed. The woman whom you gave me to, who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Now, we always point out, you know, that Adam blames Eve, but not only Eve. Read that again. The woman that you gave me. Eve doesn't get all the blame, God gets the blame. This would all be okay if you hadn't given me this woman in the middle of the garden. We've been blaming ever since. Yeah. What's blame look like? It is our attempt to escape the responsibilities of our decision. To try to place that burden, that monkey on the back of someone else. And we can relate, can't we? We can relate. We can relate to the sin, to that tragedy, to that catastrophe. We can, we can relate, you and I resonate with that shame. You and I have hid before. We have blamed. And so what I wanna share next is, is, is this, and I need you to make sure that if you, whatever you're thinking about, that you are pleased paying attention to what God has for you this morning. God is walking in the garden. God is present with them. He does not leave the garden because of their disobedience, because of their sin. Even in their hiding, he does not leave. There is a phrase or term in theology called the imminence of God. And the imminence of God is something that, although as we go through this meta-narrative in the, in the next few weeks, all right, We will see often, and although it's a 50,000 foot view of overview of scripture, what you're gonna see is a God who has this overarching theme from the front to the back. What you're gonna see is that it all points to Jesus, but what you're also gonna see time and time again is this God who is there is also here, walking with you. He will walk with Enoch. He will walk with Noah. He will walk with Abraham. He will walk with Moses and he walks with us. And I want you to know that this imminence of God, this God is present and walking with us is something completely only owned by Christianity. You tell a Muslim that God is a God who walks with you and look at the expression on his face. They do not get this. He is not a personal God to them. 
Can it get better? <laughs> it can get better. Genesis 3, 9 says, but the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? We've talked about that just a little bit. Where are you? God pursues you and I when we sin. I'm gonna say that again. God pursues you and I. They hide, he seeks. They are disobedient he pursues them in their sin. It's one of the single most life-changing truths to grasp and hold is Jesus. He talks about it in Luke 15, that, that the coin is lost and it is pursued. And the sheep is lost and the shepherd pursues the sheep and grabs it and brings it back. And when you and I sin, God is close by. He comes to us. Now, whether we will accept that, whether we are willing or whether we are hide, that's up to us. But he is not far away. And the questions he may ask you in your heart and spirit are to restore the relationship, not to drive you deep into shame. He does not wink at sin. Your sin is more serious to him, I promise, than it is to you. Because he knows the exact nature and he knows the consequences that you will pay dearly for your sin. He is a jealous God. Years ago, I read this, I heard this song called Your Kindness Leads You to Repentance by an artist, Christian artist named Leslie Phillips. And then one day I read this in Romans, the second chapter in the fourth verse. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Repentance is not just a turning away from sin. It is turning to the God who is pursuing you. He is not far away. He sees you, child, in your sin and in the dangerous place that you are and he pursues you in that. Well, I wish I could tell you that God's creation learned from the catastrophe, but you're gonna find that Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's son, you're gonna find that, that, that Cain is jealous of Abel and God will come to him because he walks with him and says, hey, it's Cain, sin is crouching at your door. You must conquer that desire. And he doesn't. He kills his brother. And sometime later, generations later, there'll be a man by the name of Lamech and he will, he will, he will boast, I've killed 70 men because of his pride. And there will be a time when every intention of his heart, man's heart will be only evil. And it says that it grieves the heart of God that he made men. So let's take this home. First of all, on temptation. Provision and pleasure and power. Which is one, which hook, which hook is most likely to take you down? What's the one that you will bite on? Provision? The pleasure? Or somehow having the power, the control that you desire. What tree do you find yourself hiding behind? What do you do when you sin? Who do you, who do you find yourself blaming? Still blaming your mom and dad? Still blaming other people in lives for the sins, the disobedience? Sometimes our past can set us up for failure. There's no doubt about that. But it never becomes an excuse. We'll never be an excuse for our disobedience. We must take the necessary steps to heal from the, the problems and pain of our past so we can go forward and walk with God. This morning, would you just close your eyes for just a moment as we close? Would you visualize God coming into, coming to you and calling to you as a father to a child? That's tough for some of you. That's something very, very contrary to what you have been taught by mom and dad, 
or another pastor or a Sunday school teacher. And as your loving father steps to you, can you hear yourself confess a sin that you hold right now in your heart? The church is the body of Christ here on earth, sent to do his mission. Will you step into the community that as Christ does will encourage you and support you and hold you accountable and pray for you and that you can do those things also for them. You can open your eyes for a moment. What time is it? It's time. It's time to quit hiding. It's time this morning to come out from behind the trees. It's time to quit living in shame. It's time to begin to believe the truth that God is a God not who steps out of the garden, but steps towards you in the midst of the garden that he has given. And could I remind you that God knows? And could I remind you this morning that God is with you and he is pursuing you and that while sin, our sin breaks our relationship with God, but God will do and has done everything possible for that relationship to be healed and made right again, he would take an animal and that animal would have to be killed so that their sin could be covered and their disgrace could be covered. And now, for your and I's sin, Christ has died. And through his death, our sin and our disgrace is covered. Disgrace can only be removed by grace. This morning is the decision. Step towards the God who is walking towards you. Step out from behind the trees. It's time to quit hiding and find all that he has for you and I as we walk with God.